Widely considered one of the great naval leaders of our time, Admiral James Stavridis spent more than 30 years in the U.S. Navy commanding a Navy destroyer squadron and an aircraft carrier battle group in combat. He received more than 50 medals over his career, ultimately rising to the rank of four-star admiral. In his new book, To Risk It All, Admiral Stavridis presents nine pivotal moments of leadership from the 250-year history of the U.S. Navy. The account is an action-packed and studied account of decision-making under extreme pressure. For today's conversation, Admiral Stavridis is joined by decorated former Marine Corps Special Operations Team Leader and National Book Award-nominated novelist Elliot Ackerman. Ackerman and Admiral Stavridis are co-authors of the national bestseller, 2034, a novel of the next world war. Copies of To Risk It All are available for purchase from Left Bank Books, St. Louis's premier independent bookstore. Well, my friend, Admiral Jim Stavridis, it is great to be back with you again, and uh, huge congratulations on uh, To Risk It All, a, a book I enjoyed immensely. I tore through all nine of the case studies uh, as a, not a former Navy officer, but a former Naval officer as a Marine. It was also a lot of fun for me to dip into, back into a lot of this history, uh, which I had learned from my ROTC uh, midshipman Dave's, but I, I just want to, I want to ask sort of, tell me about the, the inception of the book. This, uh, came about from reading history. And before I even dive in, I've just got to say, Elliot, what a pleasure to be with you. My, uh, very esteemed co-author on our New York times bestseller. I can't resist saying 2034, a novel of the next world war, which is now up to 22 languages. It's going to be printed in. So, our collaboration continues, and I'm looking forward to our next volume, uh, 2054, which we are working on even as we do uh, this particular book talk. Um, Elliot, this came about because I was reading uh, World War II history in the Pacific, preparing to write our book, 2034, looking at a sweeping, scaled war in the Pacific, and I came across um, a vignette, a, a real moment in history, uh, which was sometimes called the last stand of the tin can sailors. Tin can sailors, as you know, are destroyer officers, smaller kinds of warships and combatants. And the, the, the snapshot in history that caught my attention was at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, a, a small squadron of destroyers that weighed maybe 2,000 tons apiece, charged the Japanese main battle line. And there was nobody behind them. There were no carriers back there. There were no American battleships. It was just these little tiny destroyers guarding Elliot, Marines and soldiers on amphibious ships, preparing to land troops ashore uh, in Leyte Gulf in, uh, on the uh, Philippine Islands. So the, this handful of destroyers saw this massive Japanese fleet. Uh, to give you a point of comparison, the leading ship of which was the battleship Yamamoto, 80,000 ton warship, married up with uh, many other battleships and cruisers. Uh, again, tens of thousands of tons against these tiny little destroyers. And they charged this huge Japanese force uh, doing what destroyers did in those days, which is laying a smoke screen and then firing torpedoes. And then what you're supposed to do is get the hell out of the way and let your cruisers and battleships engage the enemy. The problem was there were no cruisers and battleships. They were all up north with Admiral Halsey, who had been lured off by a Japanese feint. And so these destroyers charged and kept charging and started popping their little five-inch guns at these massive Japanese warships. Um, the Japanese warships, of course, engaged them, sank most of them, 
and were able to uh, to to destroy this fleet of tin can sailors. And so it's a remarkable story. And the lead ship was the USS Johnston. It was commanded by a, the only Native American officer on the armed forces in the United States. You, you know, you kind of can't make this up. Um, and, and, and he uh, was someone who won the Medal of Honor for this action. What occurred to me was what was going through his mind? as he charged, as mm -hmm. he knew that he was literally risking it all. I mean, it was, uh, was it done in a moment of just blood fury and combat? Was it coldly calculated? And, and by the way, the happy ending to the story, even though many of those destroyers were sunk and the commander himself died, uh, went down effectively with his ship. But the Japanese, believing that there had to be cruisers and battleships behind them, turned around and left. So a pretty remarkable, if you will, bonsai charge uh, by these tin can sailors. It's a remarkable moment in American naval history. And Elliot, it got me thinking about this idea of risk. What's going through people's minds when they take those kinds of risks, when they literally risk it all? Well, and it really, I mean, the book, traces the arc as well of the United States Navy. So uh, we begin with our first case study, uh, which is of that fearless sailor, John Paul Jones in the 18th century, who has a sort of a, a similar situation where he, you know, he, you know, he famously said, I have not yet begun to fight uh, when he needs to decide whether or not to, to strike his colors when he is fighting against the British. And so, you know, I could see there there's certain very you know obvious strands of how some of these decisions interplay with one another. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit about some of the, kind of the less obvious uh, case studies, because because all of the you know of these nine, you know, a few of them are these sort of you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, and what you know, and Admiral Farragut is one of the case studies. But many of them are are, are these very nuanced uh, decisions uh, that I find were fascinating because there's sort of it's like. What's the right answer here? Yeah, first of all, there are nine of these studies, nine stories, nine C stories, if you will. And um, I chose nine uh, because 10 seemed like a little slick. And, uh, and I was going to ask. And nine is also, you'll like this, uh, nine is the cat of nine tails. When sailors were flawed. That's right, yeah. They were struck with the nine tails of the cat. And so I was trying to work in an allusion to the fact that some of these decisions will turn out very badly. And, you know, Elliot, it would have been easy to pick, you know, 10 case studies of really brilliant decisions that turned out excellent. Um, I don't think that's really much of a book. Um, what I tried to do in the nine case studies is show some cases where it didn't turn out very well at all. Uh, one is a, mm -hmm. a very tragic one, which is the capture of the USS Pueblo. This was an intelligence gathering ship during the Cold War, small ship, almost no armament on it, operating off the coast of North Korea, gathering intelligence. They're in international waters, have perfect right to be there. Um, inexplicably, the U.S. Navy didn't provide air cover, didn't have a combatant anywhere near them. The North Koreans came out and surrounded the USS Pueblo and gave the captain essentially an impossible choice, which is either you surrender your ship, strike your colors, or we will sink your ship. And if anybody's floating in the water afterwards, we're going to machine gun them. So it's a, a, a purely binary choice for the captain of the ship. Um, unlike John Paul Jones, in the very first uh, story, he has literally no means to resist. So he does what I would have done and what I think any sensible commander would do, which is strike the colors, surrender, live to fight another day. Um, tragically, uh, his crew was held captive, brutally tortured. He himself had been shot during the uh, run-up to the capture uh, it was in every way uh, a really dark outcome. However, eventually, a year or so later, their release was negotiated. And to my mind, that validates what happened. 
But here's the cat of nine tails, Elliot. He comes back and he's court-martialed. He's court-martialed because he gave up his ship. And that is, in fact, a violation of Navy regulations. If you have the means to resist, you will not give up your ship. And so at the court-martial, they said, well, you could have used your small arms. You know, they had some rifles and some pistols. You could have tried to repel them with fire hoses. You could have hit them with, you know, oars if they tried to board your ship. I mean, to my mind, that's not truly a means of resistance. But he was court-martialed and found guilty. And fortunately, in my view, because otherwise it would have been a real miscarriage of judgment, in my view, the case was overturned by the Secretary of the Navy and his sentence, if you will, was mm -hmm. commuted. But he, he was career terminated. He was shunned by many Navy officers. Um, it, it's an example of when you're right there in that moment, you know, you don't have time to weigh all these alternatives and think about what's going to happen. You have to decide now, now, now. That's what he did. And he, he ended up facing an enormous amount of criticism and career termination uh, from many who weren't there when he had to make that decision in the furious moments of combat. Well, one, one of the things I really appreciated um, in the book is, you know, these case studies are not given a sort of antiseptic treatment. I mean, you, you know, you, you write uh, how each of them have factored into your own life, your own evolution as a decision maker, um, starting with learning about John Paul Jones as a, as a plea midshipman at the Naval Academy up to time you spent in the Pentagon and, and the case that you just referred to of uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Butcher, uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, you discuss how inside the Navy it was very hotly debated whether or not he had made the right decision and write about a conversation you had with an officer who you really esteemed and respected, but ultimately the two of you came down on, on different sides of this. Yeah, this was Vice Admiral Hal Bowen. He was a deep, deep mentor of mine. He was the president of the board that court-martialed Lloyd Booker, and he was very harsh in his judgments about Booker. And I said, well, Admiral, what, what would you have done? And he said, I would have got, gotten my pistol, gone up on deck, and started shooting at the Korean gunboats until they machine gunned me down. I, I respect Admiral Bowen deeply, but I also respect Booker's choice, which saved the lives of his crew. And, you know, it, it is a balance, but again, um, in these really hard decisions, these decisions you make under extreme pressure, be prepared for criticism from those who weren't there at the time. And have you, have you found or did you find in your career as you ascended to levels of increased responsibility that the decisions you were confronted with were frequently ones in which you know, the, the, you're, you're presented with two bad alternatives and you have to, like, like Commander Booker or many of the other case studies that, 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 that are in the book, you're just trying to, to weigh what is the best of two bad options. Did you find that in your own career uh, as, as you ascended? I did, um, but not any truly dramatic moment, the way that these uh, case studies, each of them are faced with choices. The most modern example um, is really pulled right from the headlines of a couple of years ago. You may recall the carrier Roosevelt um, came down with, if you will, COVID in the very early days of the pandemic. I mean, in the first few months of the pandemic in 2020. And it was kind of ripping through the crew. And you remember in those days, of course, there were no medical treatments. There was no vaccine. And the standard advice was try and socially distance to uh, keep the virus from spreading. Well, you can't socially distance on a U.S. Navy warship you know, picture your suburban kitchen and there are nine people living in it. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the captain of that warship, Brett Crozier, had a terrible set of choices in front of him. He could either just keep going, and, and if he had been in a real all-out war, I think he would have. But 
It was not wartime operations. He was on very important missions all over the Pacific, but not actual combat. And so he went to the Navy and he sent an email to his chain of command and said, look, I think we should pull the Roosevelt off the line, figure out what's going on, um, and stop this virus before my crew becomes overwhelmingly infected. Unfortunately for Brett, Captain Crozier, that email got out into the public and uh, got published and it created a lot of controversy. And again, much like Lloyd Booker, um, those who weren't there and walking in the boots of Captain Crozier were very quick to criticize and to say um, he should have just kept his ship on the line, he, he should never have written that email, he embarrassed the Navy, it also became kind of a political football as uh, this was during the Trump administration. President Trump made a comment like, who does this captain think he is, Ernest Hemingway, referring to him writing the email, which was very well written, by the way. Uh, and so it became kind of a political football, and it culminated in this almost ridiculous moment where the acting secretary of the Navy, a man named Tom Modley, got on a jet, flew out to Guam, and personally fired the captain, relieved him for cause. This is then followed by his crew in the thousands turning out and applauding their captain as he walks off the ship for the last time, having been fired by this acting secretary of the Navy. And, and, and so, terrible set of choices. Um, but I love that case study because I think, again, it's all about criticism from people who weren't there when you had to make that decision. And um, for myself, I'll give you perhaps the closest to this, Elliot, was in a hostage rescue situation. When I was commander of U.S. Southern right. Command, we had three contractors who had been held by the FARC, a terrorist group, in the jungles of Colombia for many years. And my special forces were closing in on the location of the hostages. But as you know well from your time as a recon Marine, um, and of course recon Marines are trained in hostage relief, hostage rescue operations, you know, the odds aren't good in these hostage rescues. Yeah. Typically, statistically, two out of three times a hostage is going to get popped uh, because the those yeah. holding it have protocols in place. You know, hey, if you hear gunshots, the first thing you do is go in there and shoot all the hostages. Um, so I was faced with this, ter I felt, terrible dilemma. My special forces teams were saying, Admiral, we got this. We're, we're around them. We know where they are. We can... We can do this. They had, you know, built mock-ups of the camp. They had practiced. Um, on the other hand, the families were saying to me, you know, whatever you do, Admiral, don't get our sons, husbands, daughter, or sons, husbands, fathers killed. Um, you know, and so back and forth, back and forth. We finally decided to to make the move. I briefed the National Security Council. We got permission to do it. And then the FARC slipped away again, and they, they got out of the noose. Um, that was as hard a decision as I can remember making. And, and I realized, you know, there's no good option here. You know, if we're lucky, we right. can save these guys, but the odds are they're going to get killed. Happy ending to the story. A year later... The Colombians, the Colombian military, our allies, came up with a very clever scheme um, that extracted them peacefully by pretending to be a non-governmental media organization. Very clever. We did the back office, shall we say, for that, and it, it came out well. So perhaps I dodged a bullet, or more importantly, those hostages quite literally dodged a bullet. But that's an example of the kind of very hard choices you have to make. One of the things I really enjoyed in the book is, you know, as much as kind of woven through it are your own experiences, also woven through it is almost like a cultural topography of the U.S. Navy in terms of the types of decisions that are being made. And I was hoping because you write a little bit about it, you could sort of just discuss that kind of that evolution 
um, and how important organizational cultures are and and those cultures need to adapt so that decision makers can be making the right decisions. 100% correct. Without walking through all these things, let's just skip ahead to the American Navy of the Second World War and you see two figures that I think are are very important and iconic in this regard as we tell this story. You see Dory Miller, an African-American cook, because in the 1930s and 40s, the only thing you could do as an African-American in the U.S. Navy, I'm ashamed to say, was you could be a cook, basically a valet for the officers. What he did was an act of true heroism to, to run literally toward the sound of the guns and man an anti-aircraft gun while Japanese planes are firing tracers and dropping bombs and torpedoing these battleships. Um, he is up there never having fired one of these weapons. Later, he was asked, how, how'd you do, do this so well? And he said, well, it's just like shooting ducks. You just have to get out there in front of the target. And it, it's just such a, mm -hmm. a heroic story. And by the way, um, a, a couple of weeks afterward, Chester Nimitz, my personal idol, um, sought him out and ensured that he received the Navy Cross. Um, and, and by the way, we all know, you know, medals kind of come and go. Um, boy, never was there a more deserved Navy Cross. And for him to receive that as an African-American in that era, uh, I thought I learned a lot um, as, I, as I dug into Dory Miller and, and came to have this kind of real affection for him and his story that's really stuck with me. And by the way, um, about a year ago, the Navy announced that our next huge 100,000 ton nuclear powered aircraft carrier will be the USS Miller. So uh, his, his name will sail on uh, in, into history for decades to come on that carrier. Um, my personal closest friend of these admirals, most of whom had passed to the great fleet in the sky a long time ago, but a personal close friend is a woman named Michelle Howard, who ultimately ended up with four stars, but she was the one star commander during the rescue uh, off the Maersk, Alabama of Captain Phillips and just did a stellar job. And you know, you can drop a plumb line from Dory Miller in World War II, African-American to Michelle Howard, four star in command of a critical mission with, with bad choices in front of her, a hostage situation. She made all the right choices. Um, anyway, you're, you're right to observe the way the book, I hope, helps tell the story of the Navy alongside these very, in my view, very inspirational and, and very educational uh, stories. Some come out well, some come out not so well. I think it's, a, it's an example of how nations can look at an act of valor and learn from it and grow. And certainly the Navy has done so. And I think this will help our own national journey in this regard. As we wrap up, I'm wondering, was there one reader that you had in mind as you were writing this book? Um, I mean, I often get asked that question and oftentimes my answer is, is, is no, but I was, was sort of, you know, I could, I could imagine a history enthusiast reading this book. I can imagine many a midshipman reading this book. It's a type of book I wish I could have read when I was a midshipman and thinking and thinking about different views of leadership. But I was just wondering if you had uh, any one or kind of group of people in mind as you were writing this book. I did. And this may or may not surprise you, but the, the reason I wrote this book is not for military people. Military people grapple with this all the time. They are constantly risking it all. And I think this book will be interesting and informative to them, and it may help them as they wrestle with the kind of choices you and I made um, in combat and in the kind of situations we've talked about. I wrote this book for civilians who think that they're never going to face a moment like this. But you may very well. I'll give you an example. I wrote this book for a 32-year-old white male walking around a mall who hears active shooter, active shooter, active shooter. What are you going to do? Are you going to help the old, the elders, the infirm, the children? Are you going to shepherd them up? 
Are you going to help them figure out what to do? Or are you going to bolt for the door because you're the fastest thing in the mall? That's a choice. And that's when someone might have to literally risk it all. And, you know, the moment to figure out what you're going to do is not when you hear active shooter, active shooter. The reason for the book is for people to contemplate those decisions, to prepare for those decisions, to think about what you value, to understand what's in your heart, and above all, what are you going to do when those dice land on you in that way? I believe more often than people think, they will be faced with a moment of risk in their lives where you got to make a decision right now. So many of the decisions we make, you got time. You can call your mentors, you can speak to your boss, you can talk to your family, you can take counsel of your spouse. Sometimes you've got to make a decision now, now, now. That's who the book is for. It's a, it's a remarkable book. My congratulations to you, uh, my good friend, Admiral uh, Stavridis, and I would, I would recommend uh, anyone pick it up, whether they are a midshipman or, in your example, an ATV riding businessman or anyone in between. Uh, I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, great, great talking with you, my friend, uh, as ever and again. Congratulations. Thanks again, Elliot. All the best.